Hi, I'm Eric Siegel with Eric'sTrains.com. Today we're going to take a look at the latest three rail O scale rendition of the Erie 28882 triplex from MTH. All right, so the triplex is a 28882 type steam locomotive. That means it has two wheels on the lead truck, eight drive wheels here another eight drive wheels back here, another eight drive wheels under the tender, and then two wheels on the trailing truck, which is also under the tender. So this is a huge locomotive. It's a crazy looking engine. So why in the world was something like this ever built? Well, in one word, traction. The original design for the triplex was patented by an engineer at Baldwin Locomotive Works just prior to World War I, with the idea being to have an engine with three sets of drivers that would produce a huge amount of tractive effort for use in slow drag service. Now, the Erie Railroad became interested in the idea of the triplex because they needed a powerful locomotive to handle the stiff grades along its main line in south central New York. And so to that end, three 2882 triplexes were built for the Erie by Baldwin between 1914 and 1916. Additionally, another triplex that had a slightly different 28884 wheel arrangement was built for the Virginian in 1916. All four triplexes were considered experimental locomotives. They produced an amazing amount of tractive effort and were arguably some of the most powerful engines ever made. Unfortunately, the triplexes were plagued by design flaws that rendered all of that pulling power very limited in practical use. First of all, the locomotives literally exhausted all of their steam in a very short time if they were run at any speed over 10 miles per hour. Secondly, since the last set of drivers was located under the tender, the track adhesion was slowly degraded as the tender lost weight as the coal and water above the drivers became depleted. And lastly, the triplexes produced so much pulling power that the drawbars, couplers, and freight cars of the time could not withstand the levels of strain that were put on them. And so for this reason, the triplexes could basically only be used to push trains rather than pull them. So essentially, the triplexes became glorified helper engines and were only useful for pushing heavy trains over steep terrain. Their limited use and problematic operation doomed them to failure and all of the triplexes ended up being retired from service by 1930. Now, fortunately, the MTH model of the triplex is much more reliable than the real thing. And so we're gonna have a lot of fun with this engine today. So this is not the first time that MTH has put out a model of the triplex. They've been doing it for quite a while. In fact, the first triplex model from MTH came out around 2001 or so. And to this date, they have done the triplex as a premier O-scale model in both PS2 and PS3. They have done it as a Rail King Imperial model. They have done it as an HO model, and they've done it as a G-gauge model. So it's safe to say that MTH knows a thing or two about making models of the triplex. Now, this latest rendition of the triplex was made available in the 2015 Volume 2 MTH catalog, and then these things started showing up in stores in early 2016. There are four different versions of the triplex available for sale, three Eries and one Virginian. There's the 5015 Erie that you see here with the Russia iron, and so it has the blue looking boiler. There's also a 5016 with the Russia iron. Then there's a 5015 in all black, and then there's the Virginian number 700. I do want to point out one thing about the Virginian triplex that's being offered. As I said earlier, the real Virginian triplex was a little bit different from the Erie triplexes in that instead of being a 28882 type locomotive, it was actually a 28884 type locomotive. So it actually had four wheels on the trailing truck back here instead of the two wheels that were on the Erie renditions. Now in the MTH catalog, the Virginian Virginian Triplex 
is being sold as a 28882, just like the Eries, which to me would seem to be a mistake because all of the pictures of the Virginian triplex that I've seen on the internet show it as a 28884. So I think it's a mistake, but I'm not 100% sure because I'm not an expert on the history of the Virginian triplex. So if you're interested in buying that version, I would encourage you to do a little more research to find out if indeed that's a mistake or not. Anyway, whichever version of the triplex you decide to purchase, they all share the same features and sound effects and so forth. So everything that you're gonna see here today applies to the other three versions as well. So what we're gonna do now is go over some stats and facts on this model, then we'll go in for a closer look at some of the details, and then at the end we'll wrap things up by taking this thing for a spin around the layout. So the combined length of the engine and the tender is right at 27 inches. The combined weight is 14 pounds. Now with all that weight and that extra set of drivers under the tender, you would think that this engine would have a lot of extra pulling power and you'd be right. This engine has three pounds, four ounces of pulling power. Most steam engines usually have around two pounds or so. So that third set of drivers does help out. Although there's still only one motor in the engine so it's not like you have a huge jump in pulling power but that extra set of drivers does give it an extra pound or so. On the inside, as I said, this engine is powered by a single large flywheel motor. There is a fan driven smoke unit up in the smokestack. And then back in the tender are the electronics for DCS, DCC, and Protosound 3.0. Also, unlike most other steam engine tenders, this tender has a fan-driven smoke unit on the inside, and that smoke unit is responsible for putting smoke out of the rear smokestack on the back of the tender. We'll talk more about that in just a minute. There are a few ways you can operate this engine. The preferred method is to use MTH's digital command system, as that will give you access to all of the engine's advanced features. You can also run this engine conventionally with just a transformer and some track. Additionally, this engine is equipped with an onboard DCC decoder, so you could run the engine with DCC, theoretically. However, DCC is not typically used for three-rail OSCE. All right, as we zoom in, here's a look at the pilot area on the engine, and as you can see, it looks great. We've got a separately applied air hose. There's a coupler cut bar that is connected to a chain that goes down through a dummy scale coupler. Now, of course, if you want to double head the engine or put this engine into push service, you can swap this dummy scale coupler out for a dummy O-gauge coupler that's also packaged with the engine when you buy it. Moving up, we've got these little stanchions that are on each side, and then we've got these nice, finely detailed handrails. They did a great job with these, and then you can see these nice big cylinders as well. Moving back, here is the first of the three sets of drivers on this engine. It looks awesome. We've got these great spoke drivers, and then all of this drive gear looks awesome when the engine is in motion. As we continue to move back, here we have the second set of cylinders, followed by the second set of drivers, which again look fantastic. Then we've got some nice add-on detailing going on up here, and then the firebox looks amazing with all this great rivet detailing. Now here's where things get interesting because if you've seen my previous product reviews then you know that whenever I review a steam engine I will typically review the engine first then the tender. But on the triplex the engine and the tender are basically one big unit because down in here they are semi permanently coupled together with a screw and a drive rod and an electrical tether which I'll show you in just a minute. So I'm just going to keep on going. So here on the tender we've got the third set of cylinders a nice ladder here and then the third set of drivers and again it looks fantastic. At the end here we've got the two-wheeled trailing truck which is the tail end of that 28882 wheel configuration and this looks great I really like the way they did this it's very nicely done. On the back we've got the rear pilot there's a separately applied metal coupler cut bar here some nice step detail going on and then in the middle we've got the protocoupler that can be thrown from the DCS remote. 
As we move up the back of the tender, we come to one of the hallmarks of the triplex, which is the rear smokestack. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with the real triplex, the rear smokestack is because of the last set of drivers under the tender. That's what this is all about. And as I said earlier, there is a fan-driven smoke unit in the tender that puts smoke out of this smokestack. So when the engine is running down the track, you will see smoke puffing out of this smokestack, just like the one on the front of the engine. It's really cool, and you'll see that in just a few minutes. Other than the smokestack, we've got a couple of nice separately applied grab irons back here, a nice metal ladder, and then a couple of operating marker lights. As we swing around, here's the side of the tender, and it looks really nice. There's not much to see here. There's some really nice rivet detail and a nice crisp eerie logo, but that's about it. Here's a look at the gap between the engine and the tender, and this is really one of my favorite spots on this engine because it's so well done. The gap is very prototypical. We've got a drop plate connecting the engine to the tender so that the crew can walk back and forth. You can see we've got a couple of separately applied grab irons. There's some more to see inside, but as I said earlier, the engine and the tender are semi-permanently coupled together. But in just a few minutes, I will actually uncouple them so that we can get a better look at what's inside here. Here's a look at the exterior of the cab. We've got some great rivet detail going on, a nice crisp road number. You can see one of the two hand-painted crew figures on the inside. We'll get a better look at the inside of the cab later. There's a window here with a clear plastic insert, and then there's a window on the front as well that also has a clear plastic insert. As we pull back from the cab, you can see we've got lots of great add-on detailing all over the place with the handrail and the pipes and so forth, and some nice cast-in details as well. As we continue to pull down, again, everything's looking great, and then when we get to the end of the boiler, lots of add-on detailing going on and a couple of separately applied legible builder's plates. You know, as I look a little closer at these builder's plates, I don't think they're add-on pieces at all. I think they're decals that have been applied to the side of the boiler. And then here we have the front of the boiler. We've got a couple of operating marker lights on either side. The beginnings of those separately applied handrails that run down either side of the boiler. Some nice cast-in details and a really cool headlight assembly with an operating headlight in the middle, of course. Here's a quick look down the other side of the boiler. It looks pretty much the same as the side you've already seen, although we do have some different equipment here and there. It looks great. Up on top of the triplex, we've got the first smokestack, and as I said before, there is a fan-driven smoke unit down in there. And as always, to load smoke fluid into the smoke unit, you simply pour the smoke fluid directly down the stack. Behind that, we've got some nice add-on piping with some hand-painted detailing going on, and a couple of nice sand domes. Moving back, we've got some more add-on detailing that looks nice, and then we have our little brass bell. And there's a metal lanyard attached to it that goes all the way back to the cab. And then we've got a steam dome here with some hand-painted detailing over here and another lanyard that also goes back to the cab. Behind that, we've got some hand-painted pop-off valves and a hand-painted whistle, which again has another lanyard on it that goes all the way back to the cab. And then we've got a couple of nicely done sand domes back here as well. Now we're back on top of the cab. You can see those three lanyards that I mentioned going into the cab. And then on top of the cab here, we've got a couple of roof vents that open up like that. Now we transition from the roof of the cab to the top of the tender, and we've got a real coal load up here. Looks great. Behind that coal, we've got some nice add-on details there. Then we've got this lid that flips up. There's nothing underneath, but it does flip up, which is nice. And then we've got the rear smokestack, and as I said before, there is a fan-driven smoke unit down in there. And just like on the front smoke unit, to load smoke fluid down into the smoke unit, you pour that smoke fluid directly down the stack. Alright, now we're going to check out the underside of this thing. And because the engine and the tender are coupled together, as I said before, I've actually had to use two engine cradles to hold this thing. Now, this is probably a good time to tell you that this is one of those engines that really doesn't like to be handled. Obviously, I'm doing a lot of handling for this review, but my recommendation is that if you buy one of these engines, if it's at all possible, once you put it on your layout, leave it on the layout and keep the handling to a minimum. Because 
the fact that the engine and the tender are joined together, it makes it a very unwieldy and awkward engine to pick up and maneuver with your hands. It's heavy for one, and then you've got this joint to deal with, and if you're not careful, you could scratch the paint or otherwise damage the engine. And so again, my recommendation is that if it's at all possible, put the engine on the track and leave it there. Anyway, if we zoom in on the engine, you can see that we've got two pickup rollers, one on each set of drivers, and then we've got two traction tires on the last axle of each set of drivers. And then one other thing I want to point out is that I really like the job they did on the wheels on the lead truck and the trailing truck back on the tender. They look great. They have a very realistic look to them because they're not as flanged as a lot of high rail wheels are. And so for that reason, they kind of have a scale wheel look even though they are high rail wheels. They look great. On the underside of the tender, we've got another pickup roller and two more traction tires on this last set of drivers. Then we've got that rear truck, and again, I really like the way these wheels are done. They are high rail wheels, but they almost look like scale wheels. And then down here, we've got the speaker for the sound system. The master volume knob is right here. The master smoke volume knob is on the other side. And then right over here is a switch that toggles between DCC and DCS operation. Now I'm going to do something here. I'm going to separate the engine and the tender so that we can get a look at what's in between them and we'll also be able to get a good look at the interior of the cab and we'll be able to see just how the engine and the tender are connected together in the first place. But I'm going to put it out there, kids don't try this at home because if you don't know what you're doing you could get them apart, that's easy enough, but then not be able to get them back together. So like I said, unless you know what you're doing just leave them alone. I would leave them alone. The only reason I'm doing this is for the benefit of this video. Once I get them back together, if I can help it, I will never separate them again. So there are three steps needed to separate these units. First, we're going to take out this big screw. After that, we're going to pull out a drive rod that's underneath. Then we're going to unplug an electrical tether. All three of these steps are pretty easy. Like I said, the trick will be when we try to put them back together. So we'll start by removing this screw. And then with that screw gone, we can now pull the engine and the tender apart. Now there's a drive rod right here that's going to drop down like that. And then we've got this electrical tether. And we'll just unplug it like that. And there we go. Okay, so if I bring a light in, now that the tender is out of the way, you can see part of the big flywheel motor that drives this engine. And then here is the drive rod that we had to pull apart. This drive rod is what makes it possible for the motor in the engine to propel the third set of drivers that's in the tender. And this is going to be the tricky part about getting the engine and the tender back together because this square rod has to fit into a square shaped receptacle on the tender. And so like I said, unless you know what you're doing, it can be a little tricky. With the engine back upright, we can now see the back of the cab. We've got a nicely done drop plate here. There are three curtains around the entrance. We've got a couple of clear plastic windows. And then we've got the interior of the cab. There's a lot of piping going on. It looks really cool. There's not a whole lot of detailing here in the middle, but then again, there doesn't have to be because under normal operations, you're never gonna see this. However, in front of each of the crew figures, which is an area that you can see from the outside, there are a lot of hand-painted valves and gauges. It looks great. Here's a look at the front of the tender. You can see we've got some nice cast-in detailing up here. You can get a better look at the cylinders down here. Here is the electrical tether, of course. And then right here is that square receptacle that the rod coming from the engine needs to plug into. Now, this rod goes all the way back to the drivers. And actually, if I rotate this rod with my fingers, you'll see that it actually moves the drive wheels on the tender. Pretty cool. Now, I don't want to move this too much because right now I do not want to change the position of the drive wheels on the tender relative to the drive wheels on the rest of the engine. However, there are times when you may want to do that. 
but that is a topic for another day. If I start talking about that, I'll go way off topic. So I'll do a video on that at a later date. All right, the engine and the tender are now back together. Now, I did not film the process for putting them back together for two reasons. Number one, the process of getting that rod back into the receptacle on the tender is very tedious work, and it was almost impossible to get a camera in there to show you what I was doing. And secondly, the whole process of putting them back together is a pain in the butt and it took me five or six minutes of fiddling with it to get it back together and so as i said earlier unless you know what you're doing just leave it alone okay the last thing we're going to do before we start this thing up is bfimo best feature in my opinion i'm going to pick the tender as the best feature on this model and that's because it's the first thing that my eyes move to whenever i look at this engine and that's because it's so darn cool. There really is no other tender like the tender on the Triplex. And MTH has done a fantastic job with it. Not only does it look cool with the extra set of drive wheels and the cylinders and the smokestack on the back, but the spacing between the engine and the tender is fantastic. It looks like one cohesive unit. And really it is because there is a drive shaft going from the motor in the engine to the drive wheels in the tender. And there's also an electrical tether. So it's all very close together. It looks very realistic. They did a great job. So best feature is the tender. All right, let's go ahead and start this thing up. And I'm going to use the extended startup sequence on the DCS remote. Let's get her steamed. Okay, first let's check out the whistle, which I think sounds pretty good on this engine. Now, of course, there are a couple different whistles. There's the standard whistle, which you get by pressing the white whistle button on the DCS remote. And then there's the quilling whistle, which is also activated via the DCS remote using the click wheel. Anyway, let's check out the standard whistle first. And now we'll check out the quilling whistle, and as I've said before, the MTH quilling whistle, it's not quite as easy to use as the Lionel quilling whistle, and that's because the click wheel really doesn't lend itself to super smooth operation. But with a little bit of practice, you can get pretty good at it, so I'm going to give it a try. One of the nice features that MTH has on all of their engines, be they steam, diesel, or electric, is a set of preset horn slash whistle sounds that you can access at the press of a button on the DCS remote. And they always have the forward sound, the reverse sound, and the crossing sound. So here is the forward signal, which is two toots. Here is the reverse signal, which is three toots of the whistle. And then here is the crossing signal. Okay, up next, let's check out the bell.
Now, if this was a Lionel steam engine, I would play the crew talk sounds right now. But with MTH, it's best to wait until later when we do the passenger freight announcement sequence, which is always fun. Anyway, I've got some coal hoppers and a caboose behind the triplex now. Unfortunately, I do not have an Erie caboose at this time, so I'm going to be using a New York Central caboose, so sorry about that. Also, the coal hoppers are a little more modern than the triplex, but we'll just make believe and everything will be okay. Anyway, let's move it out. I'm going to pull the coal hoppers at first, and then after a while, we will push them at the front of the triplex.
list. I'm headed to the line siphon to find out. They want us to bring a string of empty cars back downhill. Hey, where are the conductor and brakeman? Don't worry, Leroy. The crew will be waiting for us. Hmm, good. I see the caboose is already attached to the string of cars. Hey, it looks like we need to get coal and water before heading back down. All right, let's get that tank filled and get going. Swing that spout over. Hey, remember, the caboose is already attached to the train. If you couple as hard as you normally do, you'll knock over the crew's coffee pot. You just keep the steam up. I'll take care of the throttle. All right, I warned you. Just keep the steam up. That about wraps it up for this review. As you've seen, this is a beautiful locomotive and certainly a unique engine. If you're looking for something that's a little bit different on your layout, this may fit the bill. Now, if you're interested in purchasing one of these, the retail price is right at $1,500. Although if you go through a good MTH dealer, you can probably get a little bit of a discount off that retail price. And as always, if you're looking for a good MTH dealer, try my favorite train store, which is Legacy Station. You can find them on the web at www.legacystation.com or give them a call at 770-339-7780. Anyway, that's it for now. I'm Eric Siegel, and I'll see you next time. To discuss this model or any other O-Gage trains and to meet other O-Gage modelers, check out the O-Gage Railroading Magazine online forum at ogrforum.ogagerr.com.